Okay, thank you very much everyone coming to this early to this morning and I'm very happy with the talk, first talk of the digital kinetics together with Barbara and other people talking about an probabilistic method for showing conversions to take relation. Hello, uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to talk about using uh, kind of classical theorem in Markov process theory, Markov process theory and just looking how we can get some results on uh, convergence to equilibrium quantitatively for equations that the kinetic theory community has been uh, interested in showing quantitative rates of convergence to equilibrium for. Um, so this is yeah, uh, this is a joint work with um, Harvard, who is here, and also Jose Kinizo and Shuki Kao, um, who are not here. Um, so, right. First of all, just the very, very general setting of this problem, which I'm, I think all of you uh, know. Um, so, what I wanted to talk about is spatially inhomogeneous kinetic equations. So, uh, if you're familiar with it, we're kind of dealing with the setting of hypercoercivity and uh, looking at equations where we have this transport streaming term and then um, some kind of collision term on the right hand side. Uh, so the kind of, I guess, most famous uh, kind of goal type collision term would be uh, the Boltzmann equation, but I'm not going to look at anything that difficult because, uh, um, well, start with something much easier. Um, but the crucial point here is that this operator acts only in the B variable and can push you towards a local equilibrium for each point in space you might be in it equilibrium distribution in velocity, but um, you need the mixing between these two operators to show you a uh, convergence towards a global equilibrium. Um, okay, so this is the equation that mainly I'm actually going to talk about. So this is, uh, you can call it uh, linear, I call it linear relaxation Boltzmann equation, it's often called linear BGK equation or even linear Boltzmann equation. Um, and so here you have the transport streaming terms before, and I've added uh, confinement in uh, space time. So I'm either going to put x on the torus or have some kind of confining potential in the spatial term. And then this is the collision term, which is very simply just a projector on the space of uh, functions whose uh, v-marginal is max volume. So you can write it like this, minus f. Um, and this equation has this global equilibrium where if you've got this term, you've also got this Gibbs state in the x term. Um, okay, so this is really uh, much simpler than the Boltzmann equation, obviously, but it has some of the same kind of qualitative properties. Um, okay, so the goal, as I said, is to show exponential convergence to equilibrium, and we want to show something equivalent to the kind of hypercoercivity theorems that were proved in, I don't know, the mid to late noughties. Um, uh, first by, uh, so, um, or similar to what Anton, uh, the kind of theorems uh, Anton Arnold showed us um, for the kinetic um, focal Planck equations. So I want to see uh, some kind of spectral gap inequality in some norm or other way of measuring the distance. Um, and uh, so the idea is to go to a probabilistic setting. This is maybe not very nice if you're not a probabilist, so I shouldn't have written it this way, but it's much, much longer to write in a different way. So what I'm saying here is that the linear relaxation Boltzmann equation can be realized as the equation on the law of a Markov process. And that Markov process is something where your velocity um, changes after a random exponentially distributed amount of time to a new velocity and that new velocity doesn't depend on your old velocity at all it's just chosen uh, from a Gaussian distribution so this p operator is a collection of delta functions at randomly chosen points in time and new velocities and those new velocities will be Gaussian um, but you can express most jump kinetic equations in a similar way to this. Um, 
So given that you can realize these kind of uh, jump operators as random processes, we thought maybe it's a good idea to look at how probabilists would show this kind of equation converges to equilibrium and whether we can make that kind of thing quantitative um, and what else that may allow us to do or not do um, in terms of uh, looking at you know when you can prove hypercursivity. So uh, it turns out one of the things probabilists do is use this thing called Harris's theorem, um, which is I think it, the original paper goes back to 56 or something like that, where um, Harris actually used this to show uh, existence and uniqueness of steady states. Um, and there are two, uh, you can write Harris's theorem in lots of different ways, but from our point of view, we're going to look at uh, two main assumptions. So the first is that you have some kind of good moment behavior which allows you to show that you're confining, that you're concentrating on a compact or well-behaved subset of your state space. See that? So that means that your process is going to spend most of the time on um, a relatively well-behaved, smaller subset of your state space. Um, so here, the moment, we want to be uh, looking at the V moment. So I've used bad notation. This is not velocity. This is just some function. Um, uh, taking pos positive values, and uh, we want our semi-group the um, so we can consider a semi-group acting on the measures, the laws of the equation, or the ad formal adjoint of that semi-group acting on um, uh, acting on the um, observables of the equation. So this is just basically saying that if we've got a discrete semi-group moving a step forward in time. After that step forward in time, the v moment is smaller than alpha times the original v moment plus d. Um, so normally uh, you would prove this by first proving some kind of differential inequality on uh, some moments of your equation. I've written it up here in really probabilistic my language, which is uh, maybe a bit foolish. Um, but what this basically says is that your equation, so if you think of a um, discrete time process, which is what Harris's theorem is really about. Um, so you're going to have discrete jumps in time, and it's saying that the process spends most of the time in some quantifiable way where this moment is small. Um, and then, so that kind of good moment behavior deals with the part of your state space where the moment is big. And then you want to do something different where the moment is small. And um, this is saying that when the moment is small, you have this kind of uniform minorization behavior. <coughs> so that's saying wherever you start, provided that this moment is small, your uh, law after one time step will be kind of lower bounded by uh, alpha times a new law. And this law doesn't depend on where you start, except that you started in a place where the moment was small enough. Um, so what you're trying to prove is that, if you think about it from PDEs, it's some kind of good differential inequality on one of the moments of your equation, and some kind of nice lower bound on stuff that starts with a small moment of your equation. Um, and it turns out that if you have these two properties, then you will get exponential convergence to equilibrium in this kind of weighted total variation norm, which if you don't like probability, can just be thought of as L1 with this weight. Um, and you have to choose your gamma well in order to get this kind of uh, exponential convergence to equilibrium. So if you imagine P is the semi-group at some fixed time, this is a kind of exponential convergence to equilibrium. Yeah, and if you want to see so it's quite a long period from Harris's theorem first being proved to getting a very like, efficient quantitative estimate on what your rate of convergence here is. But um, for me, it's not the first result, but the nicest uh, way of seeing how Harris's theorem works is this paper from uh, Martin Heyer in 2011. Um, and yeah, so the goal is we want to use this theorem to show, um, yeah, and this 
A can be explicitly con um, explicitly computed from uh, the to the this alpha D and this other alpha, which should be different. Sorry about that. Um, okay, so that's Harris's theorem, um, and it, yeah, as I said, this is how people tend to. I mean, this is a big way of showing covalent equilibrium for probabilists. It's not um, at all new. Um, and so I'm going to kind of very briefly, since this is a short talk, I don't want to talk too much about our proofs. Um, they're not like super difficult. I, I like it, it was quite hard, but it, it's, um, I'd say more what's kind of surprising is that when you apply this theorem to an operator, which was actually really difficult to treat with classical tools originally, it ends up working out, you know, relatively straightforwardly. Um, so um, I'm going to write TT for the transport semigroup and pi for this projection operator onto the state, uh, space of um, functions which are maxwell in and velocity and whatever. Um, so how can you prove this kind of uniform number bound? Um, and so the way we did it is just to look at the um, part of the solution which captures the part of the process which is jumped exactly twice up until time t. Uh, so ft is bigger than the part of the solution on the bit of space where it's jumped exactly twice. Um, and uh, so we just, um, this is in the case where you don't have any uh, confining potential in x and you're just on the torus, so the operators are very simple in this case, and you can explicitly compute that if x minus r is large enough that you're going to have some kind of um, lower bound for a function like this. And it kind of makes a lot of sense because say you start with a delta function or something very, very concentrated around a delta function in your f naught here. This uh, transport part is not going to spread it out at all, really. So if you have two different delta functions that are far away from each other, transporting them is not going to give them any kind of uniform lower bound. But once you have this projection in velocity space, you immediately have that they kind of share a lower bound in velocity, but the problem is they're at two different points in space. And this, so then you see the kind of mixing between the collision operator and the transport operator. Because this transport operator turns some kind of uncertainty or noise in uh, velocity into some kind of uncertainty or noise in space, basically, because if you don't know how fast you're going, you don't know where you end up. Um, or if how fast you're going is in some set rather than at some point, then uh, where you end up in space is going to be in some set. So uh, after this operator, we still have uh, something which is only kind of supported, a measure that's still only supported on half the space dimensions if we start with the delta function, but we've moved those half space dimensions into something which will show up if you project on the x variable. Uh, so then we have another jump, this adds a whole new load of noise in the v variable, and so now basically we're kind of completely spread out in, in a very vague term. Um, uh, and then you have to transport a bit more in order that we have some randomness in when these two jumps occurred. Um, and it turns out that you can kind of easily compute all these things and you end up with some kind of lower bound by, well, here you could even put the mass well in, but we just put balls in velocity space because it's a bit easier to keep track of all the constants. Um, so by looking at just, uh, just two jumps, we can get a very rough lower bound on what's going on. And when we have something with a more complicated transport map or with a more complicated up to a point collision kernel, you can just do basically exactly the same kind of thing. You have to do a lot more approximating every time you do any of these steps, uh, which produces a lot more kind of complication. But if you can work out how to do all your approximating well, you can quantitatively prove this for quite a lot more than just the nice uh, linear relaxation Boltzmann on the torus. 
Um, so in our paper we wrote, um, we did it for like linear Boltzmann, um, and also if you're really keen you can look in my thesis for some kind of uh, approximate, uh, jump style approximations to um, diffusion operators or fractional diffusion operators, um, like non-local diffusion type operators. But uh, this procedure becomes much more complicated when you have um, very complicated jump rates. Like if you try and do this with fractional diffusion, it, it gets really, really hard. Um, uh, and you can also do things where, say, you can only jump to velocities which are very close to your existing velocity, but you've still got a small amount of randomness. Then you might have to do <coughs> a lot more jumps in a, in a, to be able to cover your state space, but you can still do a similar kind of thing. And maybe that doesn't all make sense, but it's, um, uh, yeah, I mean, this kind of looking at just a string of jumps, you can actually compute things really quite explicitly a lot of the time. Um, okay, so here's our results, um, just for the linear relaxation Boltzmann equation. Yeah, uh, Chuki's name, this is his first name, should be Cal, I don't know how I did that. Um, <coughs> but yeah, so for the linear relaxation Boltzmann equation on the torus, you get um, a exponential convergence to equilibrium result just in total variation. And you can compute the C and this lambda. And in this case, because everything's very simple, we don't lose the variance on the C and the lambda. Um, and it's just in an unweighted total variation space, because this is quite a simple equation. Uh, when you have a confining potential, in order to prove that your confining potential needs to be strong enough that in order to prove that everything will go fast enough to the centre of the state space in order to uh, show exponential convergence to equilibrium. So, uh, this is the condition we put on the confining potential, which basically says it's behaving super quadratically. Um, and this condition comes actually from much earlier papers about the kinetic copper plank, where they use Harris's theorem, but they don't do anything quantitatively. They just uh, show using abstract hyperelectricity theorems that you get these kind of lower bounds, which is um, Stuart, Hyam, and Martin, I think, but I. I should have quoted it properly. So in this case, with this equation, you get um, convergence in total variation, or L1, weighted by the Hamiltonian of the transport part of your equation. Um, and then you, again, you can explicitly comp uh, compute C and lambda and find them in such a way that they depend on phi and how fast your jump rate is. Um, okay. So, uh, yeah, I mainly wanted to talk about this maybe in terms of future projects or what's interesting about the difference between Harris's theorem and previous methods of hypercoercivity looking at L2 distances. Because typically, those methods you can achieve much, much better rates. Um, and this is a kind of what we've mainly done. It's looked at equations where it's already possible to, uh, so far what we've done is looked at equations where it's already, already possible to prove exponential convergence to equilibrium in something like L2 um, using um, tools from 10 years ago. Um, however, uh, there are a few things about Harris's theorem which means you can deal with kinds of equations that you can't approach using these tools. So the first one I want to talk about um, is something you can see uh, in um, other papers, so this paper by Carlin, Esposito, Lebowitz, Mara, and Muo, they study equations with multiple, uh, with like two different collision operators projecting towards two different Maxwellians, plus some kind of self collision operator. And this means that you have a non equilibrium steady state somehow interpolating between the steady states you get if you just have this Maxwellian or if you just have this Maxwellian. This means your state is not explicit, and it's difficult to prove quantum inequalities or work with the adjoints of operators weight in, in L2 spaces weighted against this space. So they use um, Dublin's theorem, which is the kind of um, version of Harris's theorem where you don't need to look at this um, 
confining potential in, um, uh, you don't need to look at good moment behavior as well as looking at the uniform load balance because these kind of um, simple operators on the torus will produce uniform load balance. And also there's a much earlier paper by um, Levitz where he works, uh, I think maybe from his thesis actually, works um, on a kind of completely non quantitative level with some uh, operators producing non-equilibrium steady states for and um, quite a wide class of operators showing non-equilibrium steady states. They're not exactly kinetic. Um, and he shows uh, exponentially fast convergence to equilibrium for those. Um, the other um, thing which is um, maybe a bit less important but also kind of nice is when you look at results in these spaces, uh, it, they're really very strong, very small spaces and you need to, uh, typically this mu here will be Maxwellian in velocity, so if you're going to be, uh, if you're going to have your initial data in these spaces, then it needs to have um, sub-Gaussian or Gaussian style tails. Whereas with Harris's theorem, with our results, we only uh, look at um, moments of this type. So that's kind of exponentially smaller um, um, moment, uh, finite moments that you need on the initial data. Um, and uh, using, so this is uh, maybe, I don't know, a more subtle point, but I think at the beginning I thought that looking at these discrete jumps in time was a really bad thing because it makes it very difficult to work out how to optimise in order to get um, it, uh, like sharper and sharper rates, but it allows you to kind of access a whole load of um, equations which you can't hope to access with any kind of entropy method. So actually, um, Jose and Harvard used this um, before we started our, our project with a population model. Um, and these kind of equations are equations where whatever it is that's driving you to equilibrium is not happening all the time. So from a kinetic point of view, um, one to think about it, like, so actually we can treat this equation, so when you have um, your collision operator only turning on at some points in the state space, so say you've got the linear relaxation operator, but you only get jumped when you're over here, or over here. If you start with initial data very concentrated around a point like this, then for, there's a kind of, and if concentrated around having small velocities, you know that there's a certain amount of time before it's going to take any jumps at all. So in that time, any differential of any entropy is going to be the same as just for the transport equation. So you can't hope to, and the transport equation on the torus doesn't converge to equilibrium, so you can't hope to prove any kind of convergence result purely using entropy. Um, and production inequalities. Uh, yeah, so in uh, Jose and Harvard's model, I'm probably best off talking to Harvard, but they had a kind of neuron model where the neurons couldn't fire for a certain amount of time after they'd been uh, after they'd fired the previous time. So this meant stuff constant initial data concentrated around neurons that had all fired very recently just decay for a certain amount of time without any firing grid happening. Um, so yeah. Uh, if this Q operator is the, um, uh, the linear relaxation operator, um, there's a paper by uh, Francesco Salvarani and Etienne Bernard which shows, which gives a, um, uh, a criteria in order to have exponential leaf mass convergence to equilibrium in L1, and we can actually prove quantitative rates using these. Um, uh, using these techniques um, for that operator with the same condition and just slightly strengthened by having this sig jump rate be bounded, which is probably not actually necessary. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, there's a nice paper by Daniel Hanquan and Mathieu Leotot, which uh, looks at these kind of equations when you have uh, 
confining potential as well, and that's a lot more complicated. So we're trying to work on at the moment whether or not you can um, kind of reprove their results quantitatively using these techniques. Um, okay, so disadvantages of Harris's theorem. There are lots, not just this. Um, so yeah, as I said before, it's much harder to get anything resembling a sharp rate unless you have a very simple model. Um, with our techniques anyway, maybe it's possible with uh, more refined techniques. You have no, a priori, you have no information about short time behaviour, which you do see from seeing entropy entropy reduction inequalities. Um, so Harris's theorem works for lots of diffusion equations, but generally <coughs> these results aren't quantitative. And what we did, like the way we quantified things, only works for equations with nice jumps with bounded jump rates from above and below. Um, and this is really, so I say it only works for processes conserving mass and positivity, so it doesn't work for linearized models. Actually, there is papers now showing uh, versions of Harris's, uh, versions of Dublin's theorem, and I think now Harris's theorem, for equations which don't conserve mass. But you have to know quite a lot about how the mass behaves in order to show convergence to equilibrium for those equations. And they do conserve positivity, so you still have... I don't think it's possible to use these kind of techniques with linearized equations because you enter a kind of very different realm. Um, okay, and um, yeah, thank you.